why should you tell jokes? Because you like to hear the laughter. What, what's going on there? And the hypothesis that I put forward in the book, and it's not original to me, but it hasn't been very widely talked about, is that actually what you're doing is displaying something else. Hey guys, I'm Eric Olson, and welcome to another episode of Synapse on Science Centric. Synapse is our signature discussion series where we have thought-provoking conversations with scientists, journalists, authors, and other thought leaders. But before we dive in, a couple of quick reminders. The first thing is you can help keep this series going by liking this episode, subscribing to the channel, and clicking that little notification bell to be informed when new episodes go live. The second thing is you can help support us directly through Patreon. We have a couple of nice benefits over there, including early access to new episodes, ad-free episodes, and a monthly patrons-only Q&A with me where you can suggest new show topics or guests. Check out the YouTube description or visit sciencecentric.com support for more info. Our guest in this episode is Jonathan Silvertown, a professor of evolutionary ecology at the University of Edinburgh. He is the author of eight books, and his most recent book, due out in September, is called The Comedy of Error, which is all about the evolutionary origins of humor. So, Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You are a evolutionary plant biologist by training, and um, you've written a number of popular science books. Um, how did you get into science writing and with this most recent book, how did you get interested in comedy? Okay. Well, I've always been interested in, in writing. Um, I wrote a, a, a popular, well, not popular, but a, uh, a textbook in plant population biology 40 years ago. I mean, I was still just out of graduate school. Um, so I've been doing this for an awfully long time. And... I just enjoy writing, and uh, as time goes on, I've been find, trying to find the, the way to get the the most the best audience, the audience that's most abused. And um, one of the things that people tell me they like about my books is the humour, and that's before I wrote a book about humour. But I thought, well, hey, let's go all in. Let's look at the science of humour, and I found, uh, which was unfamiliar to me, I have to say. Uh, as to most people, and I can say that with confidence because practically nobody has written about it for a popular audience before. Um, and when I looked into what the professors of humour were saying, uh, I was surprised to see that they didn't really like people to laugh, uh, or at least not to laugh at them. And they would say things like, the trouble with our subject is that people, amateurs such as me, enter it uh, simply to tell jokes. Uh, well, you know, I don't apologise for telling jokes, but I tell them in a good cause, and that is in explaining to people in a fun way um, how humour works scientifically um, and why I think it evolved. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that uh, is, is new. So um, I'm just thinking, how does one become a professor of humour? That seems like is it is it are they coming into it from another field or how how do you get into I, I, that? I honestly, I, you're asking the wrong person. You know, I'm a professor <laughs> and I've written a book about humour, but the two are, as you've already pointed out, almost unrelated. It's almost a joke that somebody who studies plant population biology writes on this subject. Except that it's a book on popular science, and what I would like to say I do is I write popular science books, and you know, it's about evolutionary biology first and foremost. Right. Uh, and the subject happens to be humor. Um, and do you find so, that, do you find that, I mean, obviously having a background in evolutionary biology helps in this endeavor, right? I mean, you're, 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 you're able it to evaluate helps. like the research and, and things like that, that. Yeah. That, and I mean, you know, that's something that some people studying um, psychology and so on, they don't come from that direction. They come from a humanities direction or they come from, uh, perhaps looking at brain mechanisms and so on. And looking at um, evolutionary causes is uh, an unusual way to approach uh, laughter and humor. Mm -hmm. 
but it actually lends itself beautifully to illustration with jokes. Yes, and your your book is peppered with all kinds of jokes. Um, some, and I'll I'll admit some of which I found funny, and some of which I didn't. So, um, <laughs> um, but I guess humor is somewhat subjective in terms of what we, what what sort of jokes we enjoy. Yes, so it's subjective. Um, and it's no surprise that some jokes are funny to some people and not to others because they play upon our preconceptions. I mean, the way a, a joke typically works is as a setup, which leads you uh, your mind in one particular direction. And there's a punchline which goes off in a, in a totally different direction. And then there's a resolution that happens in the brain. And this brings the two things which are incongruous together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the incongruity and the surprise is sufficient, then that triggers laughter or a sense of amusement or both. Um, and um, so, of course, you know, especially if you've heard a joke before, the incongruity is gone. Right. So uh, that's why you won't laugh. Is there sort of a Goldilocks zone of incongruity uh, where, you know, if it's too if there's too much incongruity, it's not funny. And if it's and if you can, if it doesn't create incongruity for you, you can see the punchline coming. Then it's not funny. So is it is it is it, is there sort of a sweet for, spot for sure. there? Yeah, or there is some some interesting brain experiments, with, uh, sort of MRI experiments, have been done on this. Um, uh, so yeah, there's some quantitative data on it. But the example I like to use is um, if you go to an art museum and you look at surrealist art, right? It's incongruous, um, but it's not funny. Well, why is that? Well, I guess the reason is there's no resolution. Mm. Okay, so you're, you're getting the setup, but there's no punchline and there's no resolution. Um, so uh, Salvador Dali was a great fan of Groucho Marx. And he actually sent uh, Groucho Marx a kind of storyboard uh, for a, 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 what he thought would be a hilarious movie. And it was full of uh, people with multiple arms answering telephones and so on. Uh, and it was called something like Angels on Horseback Salad. It's not some weird <laughs> uh, thing like that. And um, Groucho just didn't find it funny. And the thing was that Dali was doing what surrealists do, which is they invent weird looking stuff. But that on its own is not enough. People go, that's weird. Right. Yeah. There needs to be a resolution. There yeah. needs to be. So as in a, as in puns, for example. Yeah. So so, so if you my favorite one, which is I went to the zoo the other day um, and they only had one animal. It was a dog. Yeah. It was a shit zoo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or I should say it's a shit zoo. You see how you tell it. I'm, I'm not a professional joke teller, as you just observed. But um, uh, so, you know, there's a pun. Um, and something I don't do in the book is explain jokes. They either work or they don't. You just move on. Yeah. But, um, so, so uh, but, sorry, to go back to this idea of Dolly yeah. trying to, to create a, uh, coming up with this movie idea. So, you know, there is, there is a form of visual humor that comes to mind, which is cartoon, like cartoon strips where, where there yeah. is visual humor and there, and, but there's a resolution. You get to that last panel in the, in the cartoon strip or the comic strip and, and it's like, oh, okay, I get it. It's a, you know, you get the joke. So I think like, yeah. you know, but, but just so having like the, one, the one picture. The, the, yeah. the, the incongruity hypothesis as, it, as it's called is that actually it works in pretty much any medium. So it works if somebody's slipping on a banana skin, right? It works in music. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, there are, there are uh, musicians and bands who specialize in, um, so there's, there's, there's uh, PDQ Bach, for example, looking up on, on YouTube. Uh, absolutely hilarious. Brilliant musician. Uh, an actual professor of music called uh, Professor Schickley. Um, and uh, PDQ Bach was the 22nd son of uh, Bach's family of 21. Uh, you look at his birth dates and he was born before he died, he died before he was born. And I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And the music is highly incongruous. So you get all these weird things happening during a piece of, of, uh, 
uh, PDQs, Bach's, um, I mean, even even the name is a joke, of course. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and this this turns out to be cross cultural. So you know, there are, in Gamelan in, in Indonesia, they in Bali they 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 have musical jokes, and everybody understands how it normally works. And then suddenly they go off in a completely different direction uh, with the Gamelan orchestra, and yeah. everybody laughs. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Um, and it, it's the same phenomenon in whatever medium it occurs. So it's, either, yeah. you know, it can be slapstick, it can be verbal, it can be visual, uh, as in, you know, comics, or it can be musical. Um, I don't know whether you can get joke smells. You probably can. I mean, <laughs> I think how, you'd work, how, how that would work, but I'm sure somebody will do it. <laughs> every, every sensory uh, mode, you can, you can have a joke. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, maybe I've just invented something. That's really interesting. Well, there's definitely taste. Uh, there, there's these jelly belly candies that, that, that taste terrible and you, and you have, and you eat them. Um, and some of them taste good and some of them don't. My kids, I have two kids. They love this right. game yeah. and it yeah. is a bit of a taste joke, like, and it's supposed to taste yes. like toothpaste. Yes, there you go. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's it, a practical it, joke actually, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 But in a, using another sensory modality using yeah. uh, taste and, uh, yeah. So I think I think everybody knows that that feeling of you know this incongruity and this resolution and it feels like this subjective feeling inside of us, um, and it it produces laughter. Um, and when you think about what laughter is, it's it's sort of a weird <laughs> like involuntary response that we have to something that we find funny. Um, what is laughter? Why, why do we, you know, what's going on there? We don't even really think about it when we do it because it's involuntary. Yeah. Um, so that's a, re a really good question. Um, so most laughter is not humorous. Um, so researchers who've, who've listened in on laughter in conversation and so on find that uh, something like two thirds of the laughter that happens in conversations the kinds of things you'll overhear in a bar or a cafe or wherever. Um, two thirds of it uh, doesn't come from the audience, it comes from the person speaking. Ah. Um, and it's nothing to do with a joke. They haven't, you know, uh, people will occasionally laugh at their own jokes, which is a bad idea, but um, <laughs> because it spoils the, the surprise and so on. It's like jokes coming and people go, oh, yeah, okay. Um, so. I, by the um, way, I, by the way, I think that's my problem. I start laughing at the punchline before I say it. Uh, so. <laughs> Thank you for that. It, it doesn't uh, matter you if you don't care. It do, it just don't do it, you know, like in front of an audience. But if you do it with your kids, it's fine. Um, at least I think so. I mean, my kids, they're grown now, but they, you know, there's this thing about dad jokes and they expect them and they'll grow, but they'll love you for it. So, you know, you're playing the, the role of a dad doing yes. that. Um, yes. So, you know, don't knock it. But um, where were we? Oh, yeah. Okay. So what is laughter? So, What's interesting is you think, I mean, you know, I don't know how long the human species have been speaking, uh, talking, I should say, uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's certainly not as, you know, it, it, it's maybe two or three million years maximum, right? Um, so if we go back to our common ancestor with chimpanzees, chimpanzees are our nearest uh, living um, relative, uh, that's about six and a half million years ago. Yeah. So human speech is younger than that. And there certainly wouldn't be any jokes before there was speech. There might have been visual jokes, but people and, and some interesting work with gorillas, which show that they are intelligent enough to find things funny. In fact, there possibly are some gorilla jokes. There's a gorilla called Coco who uh, seems to have a sense of humor. But um, I don't think you'd get fun. Well, there were even possibly puns, but they were visual puns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so the, 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 the mental abilities were there, but of course you need speech before you can really get going. And so that mm -hmm. would have been added to something much, humor that is, would have been added to something much older and that, that thing was laughter. Mm -hmm. And laughter is what behavioral scientists call a play vocalization. And um, so, Lots of social mammals, perhaps all of them, uh, have have a play, play vocalization, but it sounds different in different species. Mm -hmm. um, so, what is it? Um, well, as the name suggests, it's it's the, it's the noise you make when you're playing, and it has a function. 
Mm-hmm. And that function is to say, I, I'm chasing you. I might be sort of, I don't know, I'm an animal. I might be play biting you or pulling your tail or, 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 or whatever. Uh, but I, it's not, this isn't aggression. This is play. Yeah. And the signal of that is, is this play vocalization. And the reason why, I mean, really, I mean, the reason why this is a hypothesis, this is science after all, yeah. um, that, that laughter is contagious is because during play, we want to signal back, right? If one of us is playing and one of us is being serious, then that's kind of dangerous for, for uh, it's not play. Yeah. Uh, so, so when, uh, when playing, you want this continual kind of, uh, reassurance that what's going on here, which may be quite edgy at times, um, is actually play, and that the that the physicality is not aggressive, and it's not going to lead to something nasty. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is this is a, a very good reason why laughter would be contagious, hmm. because you're essentially sharing in the mood. You're saying, "Yeah, I'm playing too." Right. Um, so and of course play. Yeah. Yeah. So play itself has a social function, out. which is to learn how to be a social animal when, of course, you know, everything depends on it in a, in, in a social species. If finding a mate, finding food, so that survival itself depends upon knowing how to negotiate social interactions. And you learn that as a child, as an infant uh, through play. And laughter is one of the ways in which that's facilitated. I think the, the, the other social animal that humans have the most experience with is dogs and playing with dogs. Yeah. And is there a, do dogs have a play vocalization uh, that we would recognize? Um, well, to be honest, I'm no expert on dogs. Um, there is a joke, which is that they laugh, but they laugh with the wrong end. Uh, they wag their tails. Um, so I think that question is best directed at somebody who, who, who you know, has a dog for a start. I don't have one. Ah. Uh, I mean, I, I, w- I see people playing with dogs, and for sure they play. Uh, you see them playing with each other. Yeah. Um, they don't seem to do so. They don't seem to make a lot of noise. Um, you know, my my casual observation in the park is they don't make an awful lot of noise at it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they can, but you know, they 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 the play is not. Um, constantly uh, accompanied by sound. Right. Uh, when they get very excited, they will bark. But a lot of the time, it's 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 it seems to me to be silent. Now, somebody who knows about dogs <laughs> may say that's wrong. But um, yeah. So in the book, you talk about this really interesting experiment where researchers were playing a game of hide and seek with rats. Could you talk a little bit about that and? Um, explain what they were doing there. Yeah, so there was a really interesting paper a few years ago in Science um, uh, about by some uh, German researchers, um, and the Germans actually have a good sense of humour uh, <laughs> against stereotype. Just, um, there's some uh, experiments that demonstrate this. It's a great German joke, I can tell you too. Um, and... Um, they taught rats, lab rats, to play hide-and-seek. Um, how long does it take to teach a rat to play hide-and-seek? Apparently about two weeks. So if you scale that by the lifetime of a rat, which is two or three years, it's about a year <laughs> <laughs> to teach a, a year of life, a year of rat, uh, equivalent of rat life, like dog years, you know. Um, anyway, so, they, but they get it, they get it. And... Of course, in hide and seek, there were two ro- roles. There's the seeking role and there's a hiding role. And the experiment is alternated one with the other. And um, rats squeak. It seems to be their play vocalization. Um, how do we know this? Well, they do it when they're playing with each other. And if you tickle them, they, they, they make this noise. But it's, it's ultras- ultrasonic. So you can't hear it with, uh, without um, some technology or a small child probably could hear them. Um, and um, because they can hear... Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Higher, I much was... higher rate, not, not necessarily ultrasound, but much higher um, uh, frequencies than we uh, adults can. Right, right. And um, it turns out that these rats, when they were seeking, were squeaking away and making their play vocalization. But they, when they were hiding, they were quiet. And that is just such an amazing <laughs> result. 
<laughs> but they, they, they obviously knew they were hiding. Uh, and this was all being done. You know, the reward was just to be stroked. Oh, right. It wasn't okay. food. It was, it was just, it was all social. It was all social. And, um, yeah. So, uh, this play vocalization thing is, yeah. And, and, interesting. and you, and, and there is some sort of connection. You mentioned the rats being stroked, but there's a connection between uh, tickling and laughter, and and that's part. And tickling is part of play. Is that how those things are connected together? Yes. So uh, Darwin actually uh, wrote a little bit about this in uh, his book on the expression of the emotions in uh, animals and man. And he said that humor is like a tickling of the mind. Mm. He said it was extraordinary how how similar it was. Um, and I th I think you know that's I can't think of a better a better way of describing it actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Darwin, the most prescient scientist I've ever heard of, uh, anticipated all kinds of things. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, which you think, how on earth did he realize that? <laughs> but yeah, anyway. Um, yeah. So it's a. Uh, it's, so yeah, it's, th th these things are linked. And, and from an evolutionary perspective, the play vocalization came way before humor. Uh, and uh, so the laughter came before the humor. At some point, the laughter and the humor got attached to each other. Mm -hmm. And then the triggers of things like jokes and so on, obviously, those are cultural much, much later. So. There is a sort of evolutionary timescale you can put to the different elements of humor. And the thing about evolution is that, of course, it operates in little steps. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't expect it all to appear in one go. Right. There are some things that occurred first and could be quite ancient. Ancient. So, I mean, play vocalizations are probably 20 million years old, as old as the, as, as the apes uh, and monkeys. Or, uh, uh, and then, you know, hum humor, humorous laughter, probably no older than speech so um one could at least put things in an order yeah so so what you're saying is uh, or what i understand is that evolution can only build on what's already there so to go from this pl play tickling play vocalization uh and then it, it, it at some point it gets attached to language which is what you mean by humor correct well, I mean, you can have non-vocal, verbal humor. Right, uh, right. We already discussed uh, those things. Right, so right. So I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that, that before people were telling each other jokes, they were laughing at, okay. at people, you know, you're about to sit down on a rock, somebody puts, pulls the rock away, and you feel like, oh, that must have been funny, you know, <laughs> before anybody knew what the word for rock was. Yes. Uh, so so maybe, that's the, maybe that's the connection, then, the play to the visual or you know, sensory humor, uh, puns or whatever, and then, and then into connection, connecting that to language that maybe that's the intermediary step between those two. Yeah. We've got humor. Uh, we, we've, we've got incongruity. We're, we're attaching this incongruity to play, but then humor has also this connection to sexual selection. So, could you like walk us through that? Because that I, I, I think even after I had read your book, I was still like, why, why, why does play, and and tickling the mind then connect to sexual? How does that connect to sexual selection? Well, that's a very good uh, question, and, and and sort of at the core of the book. So, um, essentially, the idea is that uh, why why do we perform humor? What, what, what function does it, so, so, you know, okay, people laugh in response to jokes, but so what? Yeah. I mean, you know, what, what, why, why should you tell jokes? Because you like to hear the laughter. What, what's going on there? And the hypothesis that I put forward in the book, and it's not original to me, but it hasn't been very widely talked about, is that actually what you're doing is displaying something else. So if you think about the peacock's tail, Mm -hmm. um, you know, famously the peacock's tail. Peahens are very boring looking, grey, you know, dowdy uh, uh, birds. Uh, the male, the peacock, uh, has got this ridiculous train which it rattles around and 
the males get together in, a, in, in, in what's called a lek, you know, uh, and, and display, and then the females choose which ones to mate with, uh, depending on it appears, you know, how impressed they are by the by by the train, by the the display. So imagine humour being similar, but operating in both directions. Because I'm not saying here that this is males displaying to females; it's yeah. both sexes yeah. deciding, you know, whether they like this or that person as a mate. Well, why, why would you even think about this? Well, simply because if you ask people what they look for in a mate, uh, and if in the days before, you know, uh, 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 Tinder and all those sorts of things, <laughs> they, people advertised and, and, and left a record in newsprint as to what they were looking for, there was this thing called GSOH, uh, good sense of humour. Uh, now, uh, when men said they wanted a good sense of humour, they usually meant they wanted uh, a, a, a woman who laughed at their jokes. <laughs> and women tended to, to, to mean they wanted somebody who would make them laugh. Um, I mean, I, that's, that, that could be a prejudice on my part, but actually it's supported by, by some evidence. So <laughs> there, there definitely was an asymmetry there. So what you mean by good sense of humour may vary depending on whether you're telling it or hearing it. But I think that these are similar enough that actually it's it's the same thing essentially. Yeah. Um, so laughter is this is this way of of creating empathy with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and cross cultural studies have shown that it applies, you know, in forty or fifty different languages and cultures. It really is up there in the top three. Yeah. Um, uh, so and interesting. For both sexes. Um, yeah. So. Uh, okay, so this is a pretty big clue that it's something to do with with mate choice. Yeah, and an evolutionary biologist goes, "Hey, mate choice. Okay, I know how that works." <laughs> uh, Darwin called it sexual selection. He invented this, uh, th well, discovered, shall we say, <laughs> this this process. Um, it, uh, his second greatest idea after natural selection. It's a form of natural selection, right. and basically, it says that things that um, colloquially make you sexy get selected for right because you get more mates and therefore more offspring and the you know any genetic tendency towards that trait such as a big tail with flashy markings all over it will be um perpetuated and um well it's a whole field of evolutionary biology in itself but um okay so why you know so it's a weird thing isn't it for somebody to say they want you know, I yeah, want, I yeah, want somebody, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Why? Um, yeah, like, why is that? Why would that be so attractive? Why? 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 Yeah. Why? Okay. Why would so, we be so, selecting mates on that basis? So yeah, that, I mean, that, if, that's if essentially a play behavior. You know, like as we've yes, talked yes. about. That's so. Seemed, I, I, I want. I want to have children with somebody who plays. Right. That doesn't make any sense, does it? You've got to mean something else. Um, and so um, the idea of this hypothesis is that actually. Um, being good at making people laugh is an important social skill, uh, and it reflects uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, wit is a measure of wits. Aha. Uh -huh. um, okay, and so you know you could you could set all your all your uh, prospective <laughs> mates an intelligence test but that might take a while, um, <laughs> but. Uh, much better, much more fun to see if they can make you laugh. Yeah. And there's quite a lot of evidence in support of this, including uh, some work that shows that uh, being funny does correlate with intelligence. Yeah. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, this is the hypothesis of the book. Uh, yeah. A lot of it, the second half of the book, is essentially about examining that idea. Yeah. Um, so... And... Yeah. So let me. So yeah. is does that make it any clearer to you? I, I don't know. But uh... yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you also mentioned something in the book about debugging, um, which I thought was interesting. That that maybe you're displaying. Well, if we think of it, if we think of what intelligence is, or at least as I understand it, is it has to do with pattern recognition. So if you're able to detect patterns of incongruity or create these patterns of incongruity 
for other people, maybe that's how that's connected to intelligence, that you're somehow right. able so to detect like, is... these things. Because if you're not very smart, there's a lot of jokes yeah. that you're not even going to pick up on, right? You're, you're not even going to yeah. notice the, the, yeah. the incongruity to then to, to benefit from the feeling you get from the resolution of it, right? Let, let me come to that in just one moment. But I yeah. want to say one more thing about yeah. the, 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 the sexy hypothesis, yeah. which, which is the following, that in evolutionary biology, things like the, the peacock's train that are sexually selected must always inver in, 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 uh, involve a cost mm -hmm. to the displaying animal, to the male if it's a male or the female if it's a female. Why? Because if it doesn't involve a cost, it, you, you can cheat. <laughs> right. I mean, if you can have a clip on tail that you bought down the market like for you know, nothing uh, or you can wave around a palm frond, you know, and the female <laughs> will react as though it was a tail. It's worthless as a signal because it isn't correlated with some intrinsic value in the prospective mate. Right. You know, how good a mate you'll be. Right. Right. right Whether right. you have nice babies or lots of babies or whatever it might be. Um, so. Humor fulfills this purpose as well, because it's actually difficult to tell to, to, to do good humor it's actually risky mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. risky you talk to listen to any 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 stand-up comedian talking about about things and and every time they go up on that stage they are really putting themselves on the line because you have a, a, a you know whether it's one or two people oh, and yeah. uh, as, as we are or a big audience and you tell a joke and nobody laughs that's a pretty uncomfortable feeling. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's a pretty good demonstration that you haven't really read the room. You haven't got the nous, the wit to interact, and and you know, and the ladies go or the men go, bye. <laughs> so <laughs> not coming here again. Don't want to hear you. So okay, that's so that all kind of makes sense. In it, it fits into conventional evolutionary understanding of sexually selected traits really well. Okay, but what else could be going on? So there was this prior hypothesis, um, um, which was that actually what's going on is that um, the incongruity that's being spotted in, in humour is a way of actually um, spotting mistakes. So if you, if you imagine um, uh, the world being like computer code, um, and um, where there are bugs, it's dangerous. The code will fail. You know, um, you'll cross the road, but you'll look the wrong way before crossing. That's a really serious uh -huh. error, which could cost you your life. Right, right. right. So, so being able to spot bugs in congruities could be life saving. Right, right. And because humor involves exactly that creating uh, uh, an incongruity which is then resolved so people laugh maybe it evolved out of a mechanism for debugging right, right right now that's a very neat idea but it has a major flaw okay and the major flaw is that um it works on dangerous incongruities right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you should find uh having a narrow you know you should think it's hilarious that this bus nearly ran you down because you looked the wrong way or you thought it was 100 yards away and it was actually a small bus much closer or whatever you know <laughs> i mean you can imagine this sort of, okay sure what's fascinating about humor is it only works if the incongruities are essentially trivial right Right? right. So you might laugh out of nervousness if somebody pulls a knife on you or something, but you're not going to laugh because it's funny. Right. right? So, right. so let's make sure that's clear up that one, you know, that every time you laugh doesn't mean there's something funny going on. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not the funny. Ha ha. That's not the case. Uh, we're talking here about humorous laughter and humorous laughter only occurs. And Darwin observed this again in the, in, well, you know, I mentioned in, in his book on emotions. Um, that uh, one of the conditions for laughter in response to humor was um, there mustn't be a it mustn't be a serious situation. Mm -hmm, People mm -hmm. should be in the mood, and it mustn't be a, a matter of huge importance, right? Like I run out of money or my <laughs> phone's gone flat, or whatever. I mean, things that you think are serious, and matter, yeah, 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 matter to you. Um, these have essentially got to be trivial things. Yeah. So. 
that then, in my mind, anyway, that refutes the debugging hypothesis because the debugging hypothesis says the whole point of this is to get rid of the dangerous bugs and to test the mind or the mind of the other person for the ability to get rid of dangerous bugs. But it only works on trivia. Right, so, right. I, I, I reckon that hypothesis has got, as so many hypotheses about humor have, have got, you know, some of the, the, the idea correct. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, the incongruity is important, but it's not important in a sense per se, but because of what it demonstrates, which is, which is uh, if you, you know, follow my, my, my reasoning, yeah. uh, intelligence. Right. So, so it, it, it's sort of this idea that in terms of sexual selection, that if you're, um, if you're kind of testing your partner for this ability to, to detect these incongruities, um, that when, it, when a real serious situation comes along, that they would be able to handle that because you've sort of tested them with these, these smaller trivial items. But, yeah, but there's no dem there's no re reason why if they can spot trivial errors, um, you know, they're going to be good at the big stuff. I mean, yeah. So th th this is where I have a problem with that hypothesis. Right. Um, right. It it, it 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 fails at the very point on which humor rests, which is you laugh at fu at, at trivial yeah. things. Yeah. Right. Right. So I mean, you know, you uh, pull a chair away from somebody, they fall over. Fine. If they fall over a cliff, that's not funny. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, you know it's it, it it's got to be trivial. They've only got to fall a foot, right? A hundred feet, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you're so you're more um, you 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 think that the this idea that it's just more of a, a test for general intelligence is, yeah. is is a better hypothesis for, for well, why uh, this there why this work develops. That, 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 yeah, that's right. So yeah. there's some work that does show a correlation between. Um, humor ability and and intelligence. It's not the best. I mean, the thing about social science research is that you repeat it and you get a different result. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to say it's nailed down. Right. But um, uh, the evidence is there, and I discuss it in my book. Yeah. In Great. a humorous way. <laughs> so I wanted to switch um, switch directions a little bit here and talk about the the social function of humor. And we did touch on that. I mean, obviously, you know, interactions between potential partners is, is a social activity. But, but, but what role does humor have in terms of, you know, a group of people? Um, do, we, do we have any right. sense of that? So, yes. So this has also been subject to some research, of course. Uh, well, not of course, but it has. <laughs> Um, and um, there's some fascinating things that, that, that have been revealed. So um, people who laugh together feel closer to each other. I mean, we've all felt this. Uh, it, it scarcely needs research, but uh, it, it has been uh, research. Um, uh, they feel closer to each other. They tend to have better interactions with other people soon afterwards. Um, so it just improves um, your mood. So it just improves uh, your mood. Of course, there are people who, uh, who kind of, of course, you know, uh, flog it as, as, as therapy. Um, so um, there's some evidence that the, the act of laughter, I mean, just laughing, I mean, even without it being humorous laughter, uh, has some physiological benefits. Um, and being a play vocalization, whether it's stimulated by humor or whatever else, it does have this cohesive effect. It does mm -hmm. have this, this mm -hmm. cohesive effect. Of course, there are other functions as well. Uh, particularly of verbal humor, uh, well, verbal and, 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 and cartoons and things. So it can be um, it can be dismissive. It can be haughty. You know, you can laugh at somebody. Um, uh, so um, I don't want to say think of racist and sexist jokes. I'm most certainly not going to say any. <laughs> I don't in the book, but we know they exist. We've heard them, and they are used by people to put other people down. Right. So that is a function of humor. Mm -hmm. uh, in so the that's, function, as in, it's what people use it for. I'm not advocating, obviously. So in that uh, sense, it's it's saying, like, look, we're superior to that group. And yeah, so we're going to yeah. make fun of that yeah. group because look at yeah. us, haha, ha, we're better than them, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the, the, the philosopher Thomas Hobbes actually said that's what humor was. That was the, 
the top of the, the, the you know, the the, um, the beginning and the end of it, you know, things that things, that, of course, he, he was quite notorious for his rather bleak view on life, um, which he <laughs> said was, was uh, brutal and short. Um, that, that uh, you know, humour is essentially about putting people down. Yeah. Well, you know, again, he, it can be, mm-hmm. but that isn't the essence of it. The essence is incongruity and et cetera. We've gone over that. Um, another function is subversion. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, essentially this is the difference between punching down and punching up. So racism and sexism punches down, subversive humor punches up. Right. Right. Um, so uh, there was a Tunisian dictator who was displaced from power and uh, he goes into a, uh, uh, a shoe shop to buy a new pair of boots. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the shoe salesman says, yes, sir, yes, sir. And immediately comes out with exactly the right size of shoe, the right size of boot. And the dictator says, um, that's amazing. How did you know what size shoe I take? And he said, well, you've been stomping on us for so long. We all know what size boots you take. <laughs> Uh, it's mildly funny. I like but, that one. Uh, um, I mean, there, there are many others. Um, yes. And, um, you know, you, it, it's a test of an open society, in my opinion, as to whether the governed can find those kind of things funny. Right, right. Um, so, uh, you know, in Britain, thankfully, you know, most of the time, our politicians who are at times mercilessly uh, <laughs> made fun of actually do find it funny. I mean, and they like to pretend they find it funny, even if they don't. I mean, it's, it, it would be not done to, to, to actually show that it got to you, right? Yeah. But right. you try telling a, go- a joke about, about uh, President Xi in China, uh, and you'll find a very different reaction indeed, or with Burma or... or yes. You know. So, so um, there are places where humor don't go, Um Do you think that those, um, you know, very authoritarian places in the world particularly stomp on humor because they uh, see it as that because it does have that social bonding quality to it that 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 you could subvert? A government well, if you I get mean, enough people. Well, you could people, say that if somebody yeah. tells a joke against Hitler, uh, you know, during the Nazi Reich. It's a pretty good way of identifying the people you should shoot, isn't it? I mean, oh, right, right, <laughs> right. And they and and you know the Nazis did actually do that. They actually right, apparently right. had a law against telling jokes against the Reich. Yeah, and people people were killed for yeah. for it. You know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I, um, I I know that um, you know there's a there's a famous book by this kind of 1960s radical Saul Alinsky. I forget the it's Rules mm-hmm. for Radicals. And I know that in that book, one of the one of the big things he he highlights is satirizing, you know, the people that you Satire. yeah yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that 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 you want to sort of you know neutralize politically. So I do I do think that maybe humor is unique in that sense that it it has that ability, um, whereas you know direct argumentation is does not. Um, yeah, I, I think it works to us to a degree. But these days we have politicians who satirize themselves uh, and seem to be, you know, who I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, I mean, when, when, when Tom Lehrer, the, the hilarious uh, um, maker of songs and professor of mathematics at Harvard, uh, stopped um, uh, singing songs and writing funny songs, he said that, that he, he couldn't do it anymore because, you know, the political world was sort of satirizing itself uh-huh, and, uh-huh. and he just, he couldn't compete. I mean, words <laughs> like that, I can't remember his exact words, but, um, uh, uh, and you know, he stopped. Well, you know, it's such a disappointment. If you, this was a long time ago now, if you can get hold of the recordings, they're available of course, on YouTube, etc. Uh, they're absolutely hilarious. And he, yeah. he sort of, you know, but, um, yeah. Well, I was thinking also, to, yeah, I was thinking of like, you know, John, John Stewart, host of The Daily Show or former host of The Daily Show um, during the Bush years. I mean, he was just savage. I mean, but people started to watch him instead of, you know, the cable news networks because it was just more entertaining to watch him, you know, roast these politicians. So I think, you know, it, it, it somehow can be so effective in political change if you want. Um, 
which is which is an in interesting function if you think then about all these other things that humor does in terms of sexual selection and play and maybe it's just maybe because it's fun it's playful you know i don't know um yeah but i mean there's there's you know and yet another style of humor is is self-deprecating humor mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean i like to use self-deprecating humor but yeah. i'm not very good at it um <laughs> uh and uh you know, some 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 stand-ups you know essentially that's they operate entirely on that on that yeah and rodney dangerfield being the, the sort of quintessential can be used one. by politicians to make themselves seem human right, right so you know i don't think it's as simple as you know satire undermines in some ways it diffuses things too if mm -hmm. you can laugh at yourself in a sense you diffuse the the power of satire Right. It's right. only if you get really upset about it that people think, that, okay, we've got you now, you know. <laughs> That's when the pile on starts. <laughs> yeah. Um, one, well, actually, one thing I wanted to back up a little bit talking about, um, you know, sexual selection and humor. Has anyone ever done a study to see if stand up comics have more sex or more sex partners than, than the average person? Um, there is a study to see if they live longer, um, <laughs> and, and they, they don't, um, uh, I don't recall one that, that, that asks about sex. Um, it's possibly difficult study to do. Uh, <laughs> people, people notoriously don't tell the truth about how much sex they have. That's true. Um, That's very true. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, it would be hard to do. <laughs> well, if if there are any any uh, you know psychologists out there listening, there's your study. I, I want to see it. There you um, go. Yeah. <laughs> um, one other thing I just wanted to touch on. We we're we're talking a little bit about the political aspects of humor. Um, is you know the, a lot of. Uh, famous comedians have kind of bemoaned lately that they feel like they're in an environment where they can't tell jokes like they used to, um, you know, Chris Rock, Jerry Seinfeld, Dave Chappelle. Um, and, and, and there's this concern about being canceled, uh, you know, online. Do you have any, any thoughts well, on that? I think, I mean, I, I think more generally, uh, you know, it is worrying when people can't, and I'm not talking about expressing racist or sexist root views, but views that are simply somewhere outside the norm mm -hmm. so i'm i'm not talking here about allowing people to be sexist or racist we could discuss that separately i mean i have a firm view that it shouldn't it shouldn't happen but um uh when people talk about you know i mean um about gender for example and and, and there was a, a, a well-known actor in britain who who's gay who said uh recently that uh oh, i think he said it on twitter that uh you know when he was young and just kind of discovering his sexuality, somebody could easily have convinced him that he he was transgender, whereas actually he was he was gay, right? Uh, and he was being honest. I mean, you know, and if somebody's being honest and not trying to put anybody else down, they shouldn't be cancelled for it, in my view. And he was. I mean, he was pilloried for for saying this because he he you know he was he was regarded as as being. Um, uh, transphobic, um, right, and, right? You know, so this this kind of bothers me because I don't think it does anybody good, least of all trans people, to yeah. to not face these things in a serious way. Now, somebody may cancel me for this reason <laughs> uh, for for telling you this in on on, on, on the internet. Um, but if so, that would prove my point, right? Um, and um, so I, I I don't I think. In the case of some of these comedians, maybe they are saying things they shouldn't be saying. Yeah. Maybe they, you know, it, it's an edgy business, and um, I, I'm not going to set myself up as a kind of judge of this, but yeah. uh, I do think that free speech is important. Right, and and not necessarily just humor, but other any yeah. form of speech. Yeah, that isn't to say so. that you should be allowed to <clears throat> incite violence or hate. Right, but right. That still leaves an awful lot of room yeah. for free speech on other issues. Yes. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. Um, I, I think, you know, where, where, where it's difficult is, is what, 
how people define, you know, what's what's racist, what's, you know, what their tolerance is for a particular brand of humor. And that's going to be a little bit different for everybody. But I think in a in a pluralistic society, you like you said, I mean, you have to make room for people holding different views to some degree. But then there's some things that are out of bounds. And then we argue about, well, what's out of bounds and what's in bounds. And so it's it's tricky. Um, yeah. To, well, what's to, important is that we actually have that discussion. Yes. But if it's yes. closed down, if it's closed yes. down, then yes. we're not having the discussion. And I don't yes. think anybody wins from that. Yeah, I 100 percent agree with that. Yeah, it's, um, you know, just if you just say, oh, well, you know, you're racist or you're trans. And then it's like, well, that ends the discussion. I guess we can't discuss, you know, why you think that or what. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Um, so my final question uh, kind of in that vein is, um, you know, do you think that humor is essential, essential for a functioning society? Do you think we need humor? Do you think we need more humor? Um uh, <laughs> <laughs> are there are there uh, societies that have become I mean you talked a little bit about you know Hitler I mean are there societies that have become humorless and sort of oh, well, fall well, apart I mean the the you know the Nazis had jokes but they weren't very nice jokes <laughs> <laughs> right, right I mean you could imagine the kind of jokes they had right um, <laughs> so uh, I don't think I don't think you can actually expunge humor I really don't I mean you know um, even if you manage to stop people telling jokes about 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 you because you're you know the president of some autocratic society uh they'll 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 find some some way around it right i mean um and uh so i think i think it, it is deep in our in our psyche uh because and not surprisingly because if you think about how, what it's based on it's based upon play yeah. And play vocalization and, uh, and, and, you know, something in our brains that recognizes incongruity. Um, so, um, you know, that, that you can't expunge that. There are people who can't laugh. Uh, you know, it's a medical condition. Um, yeah, but, you know, that's interesting, isn't it? That it's actually, you know, it's a medical condition. There is something wrong there. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's, that's the kind of answer to your question. It's fun, fundamental to being human, yeah. I guess, in the same it way is. that language is. is. Yeah, exactly. Great. Yeah. All right, great. Well, this is this has been really fascinating. Um, your your book is out, uh, I think, in September. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called The Comedy of Error. Um, and also, where can people find you in the digital space? Uh, do you have a website so, or social uh, media? I do. Uh, so my Twitter handle is at JW Silvertown. And uh, my website is JonathanSilvertown.com. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Jonathan. It's been really a pleasure. Thank you for having and, me. And um, I'm glad we were able to work a couple of jokes in there. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye.